I was sitting at my desk in Mrs. Brandt's third grade class, carefully practicing my cursive. And there were about 20 other eight-year-olds sitting all together at our desks, working quietly, when suddenly, Principal Garber's voice came over the loudspeaker. And she said, attention students, please make your way to the cafeteria for an emergency meeting. So we all got up and arranged ourselves in alphabetical order, shuffled our way down to the cafeteria, and sat together, all scrunched and cross-legged, about 200 of us elementary school students. And Principal Garber came out in front, and she said to us, today, a horrible event has happened that will change your world for the rest of your life. But I can't tell you any more than that right now. You'll just have to wait until you get home and hear from your parents. I remember seeing Mrs. Brandt trying really hard to choke back her tears. I remember a lot of kids getting picked up from school early, and I didn't get picked up from school early, so I thought, well, clearly my mom doesn't love me enough. I mean, why didn't I get picked up early? Why didn't I get to go home from school? Mom's sitting right there. She's, she's remembered that for about 10 years now. Still hold it to her. And all of a sudden, and so I couldn't really you know, learn about anything until I got home. And when the, bus, when the bus rolled down into my driveway, I sprinted up, I opened the door, and I said, Mom, what's going on? What? And there were the planes hitting the World Trade Center. And all of a sudden, there were headlines everywhere saying all these words I didn't understand about terror, radicalism, Al-Qaeda, bin Laden. And I asked my parents and my teachers, why? Who, who would do this? Are, are we safe here? And nobody had the answer. We just, we didn't know. And from that point on, I made it my mission to find these tools and these technologies that I could use to get the information I so desperately needed and to be an active part of these conversations. During the attacks of September 11, 2001, we were so limited with the amount of information that we could get at the time. And part of that was because our parents and our teachers wanted to protect us from the horrors of these events. But also the internet as we know it today and the technologies we use were so young, we've actually grown up with a lot of them. I remember I was 11 years old when I had my first social technology. It was AOL Instant Messenger, and I could talk to my friends on it, but I couldn't use my real screen name. So I created the coolest screen name I could, which was Sunkissed Curls 135. Next, when I was 13 years old, we had MySpace, and I loved MySpace. I loved being able to create those really cool, flashy layouts and then pick my top eight and then passively aggressively push somebody on my top eight if I was mad at them. And we didn't have profile pictures back then. You didn't have selfies. So for my first profile picture, I you know, did my hair and makeup in front of the mirror, because clearly at 13, I knew exactly how to use that stuff. And so then did my pose. And that's how this gem <laughs> ended up on the internet. So today, fast forward. These are the technologies that we have at our disposal. So let me get a show of hands. How many of you guys use one of these technologies every day? Everybody in the crowd. And the most fascinating part of that is it was organic. It's an intrinsic part of our lives to use these. It's organic. We want to connect with people. We need the information. We have this need to share. And that's something that I think our generation doesn't appreciate enough because every like, every follow, every retweet, you're advocating for an idea. You're saying to somebody, look, this is important. This is something I think you should know about. And that's truly powerful. Unfortunately, we aren't the only ones who have harnessed the power of these technologies. Modern terrorist groups like ISIS or the Islamic State have been using these technologies to spread their political message, to inspire sympathizers, and to recruit followers from all around the world. And their popularity online has been growing exponentially. When I started college in 2011, they had about 1,000 followers on Twitter, support, or accounts, I mean, supporting these ideas. In 2014, that, that blew up to about 12,000 accounts that supported their ideas. And today, in 2015, it's estimated that 46,000 accounts on Twitter now spread their ideology. So that's not even counting Facebook and YouTube and other ideas and other technologies that they're also using. Through these technologies, they're painting this picture, writing this narrative about this glamorous, 
counterculture, this edginess where there's brotherhood and there's unity and they can walk around town carrying these big guns and anybody who disagrees with their ideology, well, they get to beheaded in front of everybody and they post it online for everyone to see. Now, the United States Department recently said that media is half the battle when it comes to defeating ISIS and their terrorist tactics. So social technologies do have a place in modern warfare. If media truly is half the battle, then who do you think is winning? September 11th happened 14 years ago. And in my short lifetime, we're already seeing those scary news headlines back about terror, about extremism, about waging jihad. And it's scary. I mean, I am scared. But I know that this time it's different because we have technologies and devices that we can use that sit in the palm of our hands that allow us to access the internet and share information at the click of a button. Imagine the world that we could create if we use these technologies not just to combat terrorism, but also to be agents of good. We've already seen the ways that we can combat terrorism through these efforts during the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. Yes, it's true, the bombs did detonate, they did kill, and they did hurt people, but Boston became the center of conversation using these technologies. It became a lifeline. We started talking about live accounts, what was happening. We could connect with our loved ones, checking if they were okay. I had friends going to college in Boston at this time. And we even could use it to identify the suspects during the manhunt following the days that this event occurred. We've also used this as agents of good. Last summer, we created one of the most viral campaigns online through a simple action of capturing a video of somebody dumping a bucket of ice on our head. The ALS Ice Bucket Challenge raised money and awareness for a disease that I hold near and dear to my heart because it claimed the life of my grandmother when I was seven years old. Not only did we dump buckets of ice on our head, it got the attention of celebrities and sports teams and people all across the world about this disease. In the summer of 2013, uh, the ALS Association raised $2.6 million in the month of August. In 2014, during the challenge, they raised $88.5 million in a month alone. How incredible is that? It also became a way to learn about this awareness. We use these social technologies to learn more about the disease. So if you can tell ALS-related articles, the searches for them are need to learn more about it in English and multiplied by 18 times. But in, we learned about it in other languages too, so people were trying to look it up in German, in Spanish, in Chinese. So this truly became a global issue that started with a simple little act. Some cold water, ice, not too shabby, right? So today, I want to challenge all of you to use these technologies not only to combat terrorism, but also to be agents of good. So we can change the conversation to diminish the impact that terrorism has on our society and the voice of terror and fear in our world. I can't wait to work with all of you to make terrorism a part of our past and to make the conversation better for our future. Thank you.